Section three of Alcibiades one by Plato translated by Benjamin Jowett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Johnson. Socrates, then you shall answer, and if you do not hear the words, that the just is the expedient, coming from your own lips, never believe another man again. Alcibiades, I won't, but answer I will, for I do not see how I can come to any harm. Socrates, a true prophecy. Let me begin, then, by inquiring of you whether you allow that the just is sometimes expedient and sometimes not. Alcibiades, yes. Socrates, and sometimes honourable and sometimes not? Alcibiades, what do you mean? Socrates, I am asking if you ever knew any one who did what was dishonourable and yet just. Alcibiades, never. Socrates, all just things are honourable. Alcibiades, yes. Socrates, and are honourable things sometimes good and sometimes not good, or are they always good? Alcibiades, I rather think, Socrates, that some honourable things are evil. Socrates, and are some dishonourable things good? Alcibiades, yes. Socrates, you mean in such a case as the following. In time of war, men have been wounded or have died in rescuing a companion or kinsman, when others who have neglected the duty of rescuing them have escaped in safety. Alcibiades, true. Socrates, and to rescue another under such circumstances is honourable, in respect of the attempt to save those whom we ought to save, and this is courage. Alcibiades, true. Socrates, but evil in respect of death and wounds. Alcibiades, yes. Socrates, and the courage which is shown in the rescue is one thing, and the death another. Alcibiades, certainly. Socrates, then the rescue of one's friends is honourable in one point of view, but evil in another. Alcibiades, true. Socrates, and if honourable, then also good. Will you consider, now, whether I may not be right, for you were acknowledging that the courage which is shown in the rescue is honourable. Now, is this courage good or evil? Look at the matter thus. Which would you rather choose, good or evil? Alcibiades, good. Socrates, and the greatest goods you would be most ready to choose, and would least like to be deprived of them. Alcibiades, certainly. Socrates, what would you say of courage? At what price would you be willing to be deprived of courage? Alcibiades, I would rather die than be a coward. Socrates, then you think that cowardice is the worst of evils? Alcibiades, I do. Socrates, as bad as death, I suppose? Alcibiades, yes. Socrates, and life and courage are the extreme opposites of death and cowardice. Alcibiades, yes. Socrates, and they are what you would most desire to have, and their opposites you would least desire. Alcibiades, yes. Socrates, is this because you think life and courage the best, and death and cowardice the worst? Alcibiades, yes. Socrates, and you would term the rescue of a friend in battle honourable, inasmuch as courage does a good work. Alcibiades, I should. Socrates, but evil because of the death which ensues. Alcibiades, yes. Socrates, might we not describe their different effects as follows? You may call either of them evil in respect of the evil which is the result, and good in respect of the good which is the result of either of them. Alcibiades, yes. Socrates, and they are honourable in so far as they are good, and dishonourable in so far as they are evil. Alcibiades, true. Socrates, then when you say that the rescue of a friend in battle is honourable and yet evil, that is equivalent to saying that the rescue is good and yet evil. Alcibiades, I believe that you are right, Socrates. Socrates, nothing honourable, regarded as honourable, is evil, nor anything base, regarded as base, good. Alcibiades, clearly not. Socrates, look at the matter yet once more in a further light. He who acts honourably acts well. Alcibiades, yes. 
Socrates, and he who acts well is happy. Alcibiades, of course. Socrates, and the happy are those who obtain good. Alcibiades, true. Socrates, and they obtain good by acting well and honourably. Alcibiades, yes. Socrates, then acting well is a good. Alcibiades, certainly. Socrates, and happiness is a good. Alcibiades, yes. Socrates, then the good and the honourable are again identified. Alcibiades, manifestly. Socrates, then, if the argument holds, what we find to be honourable we shall also find to be good. Alcibiades, certainly. Socrates, and is the good expedient or not? Alcibiades, expedient. Socrates, do you remember our admission about the just? Alcibiades, yes. If I am not mistaken, we said that those who acted justly must also act honourably. Socrates, and the honourable is the good. Alcibiades, yes. Socrates, and the good is expedient. Alcibiades, yes. Socrates, then, Alcibiades, the just is expedient. Alcibiades, I should infer so. Socrates, and all this I prove out of your own mouth, for I ask and you answer. Alcibiades, I must acknowledge it to be true. Socrates, and having acknowledged that the just is the same as the expedient, are you not, let me ask, prepared to ridicule any one who, pretending to understand the principles of justice and injustice, gets up to advise the noble Athenians or the ignoble Peperethians that the just may be the evil? Alcibiades, I solemnly declare, Socrates, that I do not know what I am saying. Verily, I am in a strange state, for when you put questions to me, I am of different minds in successive instants. Socrates, and are you not aware of the nature of this perplexity, my friend? Alcibiades, indeed I am not. Socrates, do you suppose that if someone were to ask you whether you have two eyes or three, or two hands or four, or anything of that sort, you would then be of different minds in successive instants? Alcibiades, I begin to distrust myself, but still I do not suppose that I should. Socrates, you would feel no doubt, and for this reason, because you would know. Alcibiades, I suppose so. Socrates, and the reason why you involuntarily contradict yourself is clearly that you are ignorant. Alcibiades, very likely. Socrates, and if you are perplexed in answering about just and unjust, honourable and dishonourable, good and evil, expedient and inexpedient. The reason is that you are ignorant of them, and therefore in perplexity. Is not that clear? Alcibiades, I agree. Socrates, but is this always the case? And is a man necessarily perplexed about that of which he has no knowledge? Alcibiades, certainly he is. Socrates, and do you know how to ascend into heaven? Alcibiades, certainly not. Socrates, and in this case, too, is your judgment perplexed? Alcibiades, no. Socrates, do you see the reason why, or shall I tell you? Alcibiades, tell me. Socrates, the reason is that you not only do not know, my friend, but you do not think that you know. Alcibiades, there again, what do you mean? Socrates, Ask yourself, are you in any perplexity about things of which you are ignorant? You know, for example, that you know nothing about the preparation of food. Alcibiades, very true. Socrates, and do you think and perplex yourself about the preparation of food, or do you leave that to someone who understands the art? Alcibiades, the latter. Socrates, or if you were on a voyage, would you bewilder yourself by considering whether the rudder is to be drawn inwards or outwards? Or do you leave that to the pilot, and do nothing? Alcibiades, it would be the concern of the pilot. Socrates, then you are not perplexed about what you do not know, if you know that you do not know it. Alcibiades, I imagine not. Socrates, do you not see, then, 
that mistakes in life and practice are likewise to be attributed to the ignorance which has conceit of knowledge alcibiades once more what do you mean socrates i suppose that we begin to act when we think that we know what we are doing alcibiades yes socrates but when people think that they do not know they entrust their business to others alcibiades yes socrates and so there is a class of ignorant persons who do not make mistakes in life because they trust others about things of which they are ignorant alcibiades true socrates who then are the persons who make mistakes they cannot of course be those who know alcibiades certainly not socrates but if neither those who know nor those who know that they do not know make mistakes there remain those only who do not know and think that they know alcibiades yes only those socrates then this is ignorance of the disgraceful sort which is mischievous alcibiades yes socrates and most mischievous and most disgraceful when having to do with the greatest matters alcibiades by far socrates and can there be any matters greater than the just the honourable the good and the expedient alcibiades there cannot be socrates and these as you were saying are what perplex you alcibiades yes socrates but if you are perplexed then as the previous argument has shown you are not only ignorant of the greatest matters but being ignorant you fancy that you know them alcibiades i fear that you are right socrates and now see what has happened to you alcibiades i hardly like to speak of your evil case but as we are alone i will my good friend you are wedded to ignorance of the most disgraceful kind and of this you are convicted not by me but out of your own mouth and by your own argument wherefore also you rush into politics before you are educated neither is your case to be deemed singular for i might say the same of almost all our statesmen with the exception perhaps of your guardian pericles alcibiades yes socrates and pericles is said not to have got his wisdom by the light of nature but to have associated with several of the philosophers with pithocleides for example and with anaxagoras and now in advanced life with damon in the hope of gaining wisdom socrates very good but did you ever know a man wise in anything who was unable to impart his particular wisdom for example he who taught you letters was not only wise but he made you and any others whom he liked wise alcibiades yes socrates and you whom he taught can do the same alcibiades true socrates and in like manner the harper and gymnastic master alcibiades certainly socrates when a person is enabled to impart knowledge to another he thereby gives an excellent proof of his own understanding of any matter alcibiades i agree socrates well and did pericles make any one wise did he begin by making his sons wise alcibiades but socrates if the two sons of pericles were simpletons what has that to do with the matter socrates well but did he make your brother Plinius wise alcibiades Plinius is a madman there is no use in talking of him socrates but if Plinius is a madman and the two sons of pericles were simpletons what reason can be given why he neglects you and lets you be as you are alcibiades i believe that i am to blame for not listening to him socrates but did you ever hear of any other athenian or foreigner bond or free who was deemed to have grown wiser in the society of pericles as i might cite pythodorus the son of isolochus and callias the son of Caliades, who have grown wiser in the society of zeno for which privilege they have each of them paid him the sum of a hundred minae 
footnote about four hundred and six pounds sterling end of footnote to the increase of their wisdom and fame alcibiades i certainly never did hear of any one socrates well and in reference to your own case do you mean to remain as you are or will you take some pains about yourself alcibiades with your aid socrates i will and indeed when i hear you speak the truth of what you are saying strikes home to me and i agree with you for our statesmen all but a few do appear to be quite uneducated socrates what is the inference alcibiades why that if they were educated they would be trained athletes and he who means to rival them ought to have knowledge and experience when he attacks them but now as they have become politicians without any special training why should i have the trouble of learning and practising for i know well that by the light of nature i shall get the better of them socrates my dear friend what a sentiment and how unworthy of your noble form and your high estate alcibiades what do you mean socrates why do you say so socrates i am grieved when i think of our mutual love alcibiades at what socrates at your fancying that the contest on which you are entering is with people here alcibiades why what others are there socrates is that a question which a magnanimous soul should ask alcibiades do you mean to say that the contest is not with these socrates and suppose that you were going to steer a ship into action would you only aim at being the best pilot on board would you not while acknowledging that you must possess this degree of excellence rather look to your antagonists and not as you are now doing to your fellow combatants you ought to be so far above these latter that they will not even dare to be your rivals and being regarded by you as inferiors will do battle for you against the enemy this is the kind of superiority which you must establish over them if you mean to accomplish any noble action really worthy of yourself and of the state alcibiades that would certainly be my aim socrates verily then you have good reason to be satisfied if you are better than the soldiers and you need not when you are their superior and have your thoughts and actions fixed upon them look away to the generals of the enemy alcibiades of whom are you speaking socrates socrates why you surely know that our city goes to war now and then with the lacedaemonians and with the great king alcibiades true enough socrates and if you meant to be the ruler of this city would you not be right in considering that the lacedaemonian and persian king were your true rivals alcibiades i believe that you are right socrates oh no my friend i am quite wrong and i think that you ought rather to turn your attention to midias the quail breeder and others like him who manage our politics in whom as the woman would remark you may still see the slaves cut of hair cropping out in their minds as well as on their pates and they come with their barbarous lingo to flatter us and not to rule us to these i say you should look and then you need not trouble yourself about your own fitness to contend in such a noble arena there is no reason why you should either learn what has to be learned or practice what has to be practiced and only when thoroughly prepared enter on a political career alcibiades there i think socrates that you are right i do not suppose however that the spartan generals or the great king are really different from anybody else socrates but my dear friend do consider what you are saying alcibiades what am i to consider socrates in the first place will you be more likely to take care of yourself if you are in a wholesome fear and dread of them or if you are not alcibiades clearly if i have such a fear of them socrates and do you think that you will sustain any injury if you take care of yourself alcibiades no i shall be greatly benefited 
Socrates, and this is one very important respect in which that notion of yours is bad. Alcibiades, true. Socrates, in the next place, consider that what you say is probably false. Alcibiades, how so? Socrates, let me ask you whether better natures are likely to be found in noble races or not in noble races. Alcibiades, clearly, in noble races. Socrates, are not those who are well born and well bred most likely to be perfect in virtue? Alcibiades, certainly. Socrates, then let us compare our antecedents with those of the Lacedaemonian and Persian kings. Are they inferior to us in descent? Have we not heard that the former are sprung from Heracles, and the latter from Achaemenes, and that the race of Heracles and the race of Achaemenes go back to Perseus, son of Zeus? Alcibiades, why, so does mine go back to Eurysaces, and he to Zeus? Socrates, and mine, noble Alcibiades, to Daedalus, and he to Hephaestus, son of Zeus. But for all that, we are far inferior to them, for they are descended from Zeus through a line of kings, either kings of Argos and Lacedaemon, or kings of Persia, a country which the descendants of Achaemenes have always possessed, besides being at various times sovereigns of Asia, as they now are, whereas we and our fathers were but private persons. How ridiculous would you be thought if you were to make a display of your ancestors and of Salamis, the island of Eurysaces, or of Aegina, the habitation of the still more ancient Iacus, before Artaxerxes, son of Xerxes. You should consider how inferior we are to them, both in the derivation of our birth and in other particulars. Did you never observe how great is the property of the Spartan kings? And their wives are under the guardianship of the Ephori, who are public officers and watch over them, in order to preserve, as far as possible, the purity of the Heracleid blood. Still greater is the difference among the Persians, for no one entertains a suspicion that the father of a prince of Persia can be any one but the king. Such is the awe which invests the person of the queen, that any other guard is needless. And when the heir of the kingdom is born, all the subjects of the king feast, and the day of his birth is for ever afterwards kept as a holiday and time of sacrifice by all Asia. Whereas, when you and I were born, Alcibiades, as the comic poet says, the neighbours hardly knew of the important event. After the birth of the royal child, he is tended not by a good-for-nothing woman nurse, but by the best of the royal eunuchs, who are charged with the care of him, and especially with the fashioning and right formation of his limbs, in order that he may be as shapely as possible, which being their calling, they are held in great honour. And when the young prince is seven years old, he is put upon a horse and taken to the riding masters, and begins to go out hunting. And at fourteen years of age, he is handed over to the royal schoolmasters, as they are termed. These are four chosen men, reputed to be the best among the Persians of a certain age. And one of them is the wisest, another the justest, a third the most temperate, and a fourth the most valiant. The first instructs him in the Magianism of Zoroaster, the son of Oromasus, which is the worship of the gods, and teaches him also the duties of his royal office. The second, who is the justest, teaches him always to speak the truth. The third, or most temperate, forbids him to allow any pleasure to be lowered over him, that he may be accustomed to be a free man and king indeed. Lord of himself first, and not a slave, the most valiant trains him to be bold and fearless, telling him that if he fears, he is to deem himself a slave. Whereas Pericles gave you, Alcibiades, for a tutor, Zopyrus, the Thracian, a slave of his who was past all other work, I might enlarge on the nurture and education of your rivals, but that would be tedious, and what I have said 
is a sufficient sample of what remains to be said i have only to remark by way of contrast that no one cares about your birth or nurture or education or i may say about that of any other athenian unless he has a lover who looks after him and if you cast an eye on the wealth the luxury the garments with their flowing trains the anointings with myrrh the multitudes of attendants and all the other bravery of the persians you will be ashamed when you discern your own inferiority or if you look at the temperance and orderliness and ease and grace and magnanimity and courage and endurance and love of toil and desire of glory and ambition of the lacedaemonians in all these respects you will see that you are but a child in comparison of them even in the matter of wealth if you value yourself upon that i must reveal to you how you stand for if you form an estimate of the wealth of the lacedaemonians you will see that our possessions fall far short of theirs for no one here can compete with them either in the extent and fertility of their own and the messenian territory or in the number of their slaves and especially of the helots or of their horses or of the animals which feed on the messenian pastures but i have said enough of this and as to gold and silver there is more of them in lacedaemon than in all the rest of hellas for during many generations gold has been always flowing into them from the whole hellenic world and often from the barbarian also and never going out as in the fable of aesop the fox said to the lion the prints of the feet of those going in are distinct enough but who ever saw the trace of money going out of lacedaemon and therefore you may safely infer that the inhabitants are the richest of the hellenes in gold and silver and that their kings are the richest of them for they have a larger share of these things and they have also a tribute paid to them which is very considerable yet the spartan wealth though great in comparison of the wealth of the other hellenes is as nothing in comparison of that of the persians and their kings why i have been informed by a credible person who went up to the king at susa that he passed through a large tract of excellent land extending for nearly a day's journey which the people of the country called the queen's girdle and another which they called her veil and several other fair and fertile districts which were reserved for the adornment of the queen and are named after her several habiliments now i cannot help thinking to myself what if some one were to go to amestris the wife of xerxes and mother of artaxerxes and say to her there is a certain dinomache whose whole wardrobe is not worth fifty minae and that will be more than the value and she has a son who is possessed of a three hundred acre patch at urkaye and he has a mind to go to war with your son would you not wonder to what this Alcibiades trusts for success in the conflict? He must rely, she would say to herself, upon his training and wisdom. These are the things which Hellenes value. And if she heard that this Alcibiades, who is making the attempt, is not as yet twenty years old, and is wholly uneducated, and when his lover tells him that he ought to get education and training first, and then go and fight the king, he refuses and says that he is well enough as he is would she not be amazed and ask on what then does the youth rely and if we replied he relies on his beauty and stature and birth and mental endowments she would think that we were mad alcibiades when she compared the advantages which you possess with those of her own people and i believe that even lampido the daughter of leotychides the wife of archidamus and mother of Agis, all of whom were kings, would have the same feeling, if in your present uneducated state you were to turn your thoughts against her son, she too would be equally astonished. But how disgraceful that we should not have as high a notion of what is required in us as our enemies' wives and mothers have of the qualities which are required in their assailants o oh, my friend be persuaded by me and hear the delphian inscription know thyself not the men whom you think 
but these kings are our rivals and we can only overcome them by pains and skill and if you fail in the required qualities you will fail also in becoming renowned among hellenes and barbarians which you seem to desire more than any other man ever desired anything alcibiades i entirely believe you but what are the sort of pains which are required socrates can you tell me socrates yes i can but we must take counsel together concerning the manner in which both of us may be most improved for what i am telling you of the necessity of education applies to myself as well as to you and there is only one point in which i have an advantage over you alcibiades what is that socrates i have a guardian who is better and wiser than your guardian pericles alcibiades who is he socrates socrates god alcibiades who up to this day has not allowed me to converse with you and he inspires in me the faith that i am especially designed to bring you to honour alcibiades you are jesting socrates socrates perhaps at any rate i am right in saying that all men greatly need pains and care and you and i above all men alcibiades you are not far wrong about me socrates and certainly not about myself alcibiades but what can we do socrates there must be no hesitation or cowardice my friend alcibiades that would not become us socrates socrates no indeed and we ought to take counsel together for do we not wish to be as good as possible alcibiades we do socrates in what sort of virtue alcibiades plainly in the virtue of good men socrates who are good in what alcibiades those clearly who are good in the management of affairs socrates what sort of affairs equestrian affairs alcibiades certainly not socrates you mean that about them we should have recourse to horsemen alcibiades yes socrates well naval affairs alcibiades no socrates you mean that we should have recourse to sailors about them alcibiades yes socrates then what affairs and who do them alcibiades the affairs which occupy athenian gentlemen socrates and when you speak of gentlemen do you mean the wise or the unwise alcibiades the wise socrates and a man is good in respect of that in which he is wise alcibiades yes socrates and evil in respect of that in which he is unwise alcibiades certainly socrates the shoemaker for example is wise in respect of the making of shoes alcibiades yes socrates then he is good in that alcibiades he is socrates but in respect of the making of garments he is unwise alcibiades yes socrates then in that he is bad alcibiades yes socrates then upon this view of the matter the same man is good and also bad alcibiades true socrates but would you say that the good are the same as the bad alcibiades certainly not socrates then whom do you call the good alcibiades i mean by the good those who are able to rule in the city socrates not surely over horses alcibiades certainly not socrates but over men alcibiades yes socrates when they are sick alcibiades no socrates or on a voyage alcibiades no socrates or reaping the harvest alcibiades no socrates when they are doing something or nothing alcibiades when they are doing something i should say socrates i wish that you would explain to me what this something is alcibiades when they are having dealings with one another and using one another's services as we citizens do in our daily life socrates those of whom you speak are ruling over men who are using the services of other men alcibiades yes socrates are they ruling over the signal men who give the time to the rowers 
Alcibiades, no, they are not. Socrates, that would be the office of the pilot. Alcibiades, yes. Socrates, but perhaps you mean that they rule over flute players, who lead the singers and use the services of the dancers. Alcibiades, certainly not. Socrates, that would be the business of the teacher of the chorus. Alcibiades, yes. Socrates, then what is the meaning of being able to rule over men who use other men? Alcibiades, I mean that they rule over men who have common rights of citizenship and dealings with one another. Socrates, and what sort of an art is this? Suppose that I ask you again, as I did just now, what art makes men know how to rule over their fellow sailors? How would you answer? Alcibiades, the art of the pilot. Socrates, and if I may recur to another old instance, what art enables them to rule over their fellow singers? Alcibiades, the art of the teacher of the chorus, which you were just now mentioning. Socrates, and what do you call the art of fellow citizens? Alcibiades, I should say, good counsel, Socrates. Socrates, and is the art of the pilot evil counsel? Alcibiades, no. Socrates, but good counsel. Alcibiades, yes, that is what I should say. Good counsel, of which the aim is the preservation of the voyagers. Socrates, true. And what is the aim of that other good counsel of which you speak? Alcibiades, the aim is the better order and preservation of the city. Socrates, and what is that of which the absence or presence improves and preserves the order of the city? Suppose you were to ask me, what is that of which the presence or absence improves or preserves the order of the body? I should reply, the presence of health and the absence of disease. You would say the same? Alcibiades, yes. Socrates, and if you were to ask me the same question about the eyes, I should reply in the same way, the presence of sight and the absence of blindness, or about the ears I should reply that they were improved and were in better case, when deafness was absent and hearing was present in them. Alcibiades, true. Socrates, and what would you say of a state? What is that by the presence or absence of which the state is improved and better managed and ordered? Alcibiades, I should say, Socrates, the presence of friendship and the absence of hatred and division. Socrates, and do you mean by friendship agreement or disagreement? Alcibiades, agreement. Socrates, what art makes cities agree about numbers? Alcibiades, arithmetic. Socrates, and private individuals? Alcibiades, the same. Socrates, and what art makes each individual agree with himself? Alcibiades, the same. Socrates, and what art makes each of us agree with himself about the comparative length of the span and of the cubit? Does not the art of measure? Alcibiades, yes. Socrates, individuals are agreed with one another about this, and states equally. Alcibiades, yes. Socrates, and the same holds of the balance. Alcibiades, true. Socrates, but what is the other agreement of which you speak, and about what? What art can give that agreement, and does that which gives it to the state give it also to the individual, so as to make him consistent with himself and with another? Alcibiades, I should suppose so. Socrates, but what is the nature of the agreement? Answer, and faint not. Alcibiades, I mean to say that there should be such friendship and agreement as exists between an affectionate father and mother and their son, or between brothers, or between husband and wife. Socrates, but can a man, Alcibiades, agree with a woman about the spinning of wool, which she understands and he does not? Alcibiades, no, truly. Socrates, nor has he any need, for spinning is a female accomplishment. Alcibiades, yes. Socrates, and would a woman agree with a man about the science of arms, which she has never learned? Alcibiades, certainly not. Socrates, I suppose that the use of arms would be regarded by you as a male accomplishment. Alcibiades, it would. Socrates, then, upon your view, 
Women and men have two sorts of knowledge. Alcibiades, certainly. Socrates, then in their knowledge there is no agreement of women and men. Alcibiades, there is not. Socrates, nor can there be friendship, if friendship is agreement. Alcibiades, plainly not. Socrates, then women are not loved by men when they do their own work. Alcibiades, I suppose not. Socrates, nor men by women when they do their own work. Alcibiades, no. Socrates, nor are states well administered when individuals do their own work. Alcibiades, I should rather think, Socrates, that the reverse is the truth. Parentheses, compare republic. End of parentheses. Socrates, what? Do you mean to say that states are well administered when friendship is absent, the presence of which, as we were saying, alone secures their good order? Alcibiades, but I should say that there is friendship among them, for this very reason, that the two parties respectively do their own work. Socrates, that was not what you were saying before. And what do you mean now by affirming that friendship exists when there is no agreement? How can there be agreement about matters which the one party knows, and of which the other is in ignorance? Alcibiades, impossible. Socrates, and when individuals are doing their own work, are they doing what is just or unjust? Alcibiades, what is just, certainly. Socrates, and when individuals do what is just in the state, is there no friendship among them? Alcibiades, I suppose that there must be, Socrates. Socrates, then what do you mean by this friendship or agreement about which we must be wise and discreet in order that we may be good men? I cannot make out where it exists or among whom. According to you, the same persons may sometimes have it and sometimes not. Alcibiades, but indeed, Socrates, I do not know what I am saying, and I have long been, unconsciously to myself, in a most disgraceful state. Socrates, nevertheless, cheer up. At fifty, if you had discovered your deficiency, you would have been too old, and the time for taking care of yourself would have passed away, but yours is just the age at which the discovery should be made. Alcibiades, and what should he do, Socrates, who would make the discovery? Socrates, answer questions, Alcibiades, and that is a process which, by the grace of God, if I may put any faith in my oracle, will be very improving to both of us. End of part three. Recording by Kevin Johnson.